Welcome back to the Beyond the Buckets. It is my pleasure to have Sarah Dramas on the program. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Well, I would love to start with a quick three-minute backstory on you. If you can do it in three minutes, there's so much, uh, so many layers to your life as I've gotten to know you uh, over the last couple of weeks. But uh, yeah, if you can give everybody a quick three-minute uh, synopsis of your life, that'd be awesome. Absolutely. I um, started out as just never athletic. I never really was motivated or had much drive. Um, it took having some spinal surgery um, when I was pretty young to not even wake me up until a couple of years later. Uh, I was in a car accident and it shifted some things and it kind of just woke me up to searching for a little bit more answers and pushing myself and seeing what I was capable of. So I began long distance hiking, hiking thousands of miles across the country on my own. And in the process of doing that, it helped me learn and discover who I am and what my message is for the world. For sure. Well, thank you for that, uh, that, that brief story. Um, lots to cover in that. One, um, being a non-athlete growing up in your mind and now being what you would call an elite athlete, I think that's something to really hang your hat on. And, and having back surgery at age 15, tell me what that was like for you at that point in time. Honestly, it was something that was very strange to me because they found it in like a school screening when I was in seventh grade mm -hmm. and I had no pain from it. I always kind of knew my hips kind of shifted and looked a little different. And my body was shaped different from everybody else, but I was pretty confused when I had the surgery, but I was told it was going to make my life better and give me longevity. And so it was just a long recovery process. I had to learn to walk again. I got four inches taller and I was kind of at this pivotal time in my life when I was going from middle school to high school. Yeah. There was a lot of like self-acceptance and body awareness and body issues that really stemmed from it. But it, I used it as an excuse for a really long time. I've had back surgery. I can't do this. I can't do this sport. I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't ruin it. Um, it was probably one of the, the biggest blessings of my life to have had that surgery. <laughs> wow. And you were hit by a car as well. So tell me how that like transformed everything to start the path that you're on, well, that you've been on now for a while, but like that was the, that was the real thing that kind of sparked everything. So tell me about getting hit by a car and how that kind of changed everything. Yeah, I, um, I was biking to work for about nine years. I chose in my 20s to not buy a car and just bike everywhere as a commuter. Mm -hmm. And I was biking to work when a vehicle ran through a stop sign. And I basically, I was imprinted on the grill of the vehicle. She was going so fast. Wow. Um, but if it wasn't for having had my back surgery about eight years prior, I... I would be paralyzed. There's about three vertebrae in my back that are just being held in pieces by a titanium rod that's attached to my spine. Wow. So it, and it, and it, it, it just mind blowing to me how something years back that I didn't even see the purpose for, um, definitely a big sacrifice made by my parents as well to choose to do that surgery. You know, right. five kids, it's not a cheap thing to do. Um, but yeah, after that, that, getting hit by that car I was living in Florida at the time and I remember that night just going to the beach at night and sitting there and just being like I gotta do something I gotta stop just living this mundane not really it's just spinning my wheels lifestyle I need to make a change and um, that was the day I kind of just woke up I think for the first time and realized I needed to seek something for myself on purpose Wow. It's amazing that we're in this time right now in 2020, and there's just been so much that is going on within our world. And I was getting to a place where I was almost feeling sorry for, you know, just my own circumstance. And I have nothing to feel sorry for. I'm healthy. I've got a great family and great, great jobs that I love and I'm passionate about. But I was listening to somebody else speak, and they were talking about well, if 2020 never happened, well, my niece wouldn't have been born. And I started thinking, well, my daughter wouldn't have been born if 2020 didn't happen. And, you know, you never know why you have to go through something. And 
that is, that is what I think is going on in this world right now. We never know why we have to go through something. It was probably traumatic for you at that time, mm-hmm. being, you know, number one, having the back surgery, but not knowing that that back surgery ended up saving you saving. later on <laughs> because, you know, because of the circumstances when you actually got hit by a car. Mm-hmm. You know, if you didn't have that back surgery, there's a very high likelihood of you not being here. Uh, and you never know what some of those things in our life those hurdles that we have to overcome and then they turn into you know the miracles right mm-hmm. oh absolutely and i think there's a big component of that as well is is not just sitting in you know making making a place in being upset about a situation not sitting in it you can acknowledge it recognize it but don't make home in it because there's going to be a moment and maybe there's not but sometimes there's a moment when you can look back, like I, like I have done years later, and it's like the aha, the light bulb, it all clicks now. Um, and what even that day and that pain and that day, that car accident is just continuing to show me all these limits I was putting on myself for so long. Right. Um, but yeah, I'm really thankful for that. That yeah. aha moment, like we're all having, I feel like every now and then here. <laughs> For sure, and, and and I love the I love the fact that you point out limits, and the limits are really only in our mind, right? Because so many times we tell ourselves, "Oh, we can't do this," or if you're a basketball player, "I'm not tall," or you know, the or, or whatever it may be. It's just the limits that you place on yourself. Mm-hmm. It's really the only debilitating thing. If you just change your mindset, you can really hunt and find the things that you are passionate about and go for those. I just think that's so important for people to understand, but that limit that you placed on yourself was now lifted because of the tragedies that you had to go through. Yeah, absolutely. Talk about some of the other struggles that you've had in your life and have led you to such a positive outlook on everything that you're doing. Uh, Because, you know, immediately when I got on the phone with you, you were just so positive. I can just feel the energy oozing out of the phone. I was, I was, I was smiling the entire time because you were, you were inflecting that through the phone. <laughs> so, but, but I know that there was a lot of pain in your life as well. Uh, talk to me about that. Yeah, I just, um, <laughs> I've been on a path of, I guess you'd say independence for since I was 18. I grew up in Florida, moved to Hawaii, um, pretty young, fresh out of high school, newly married. And um, I just realized how much when I was there and I had myself in that situation, I never really went and learned who I was. I didn't really know who I was as an individual. You know, what was I doing with my life? Was I doing what I wanted to do with my life or what other people, other people told me I should, what my parents told me I should, what society told me I should. And so when that ended, I sort of looked around and realized I'm 21 years old. I have no family. I'm on a tiny island in the middle of nowhere what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to like navigate my path for me? Mm -hmm. And so it took a lot of, um, just a lot of pushing myself and a lot of believing in myself and realizing that at the end of the day, you, we only, we have us, (laughs) you got to learn to take care of, we have to learn to take care of us. And just through all of it, it led me to long distance hiking trails and I've been able to then use the trails and like seek out experiences and challenges to deal with my trauma and deal with my pain and to recognize it and work through it rather than just avoid it and pretend it doesn't exist because that demon will come up when we're not paying attention to it. Um, There's just been so many times on trails with bad weather or animal encounters or getting lost or any of those situations where like it could have easily gone a very different way. I am just happy and thankful to A, to be alive, but B, to to choose to want to do what I love. Like we all have a choice. I love working with children and families. I love exercising. So I work as a nanny. I'm a personal trainer. You know, like I want to always continue to pay attention to what excites me because that's where our power lies is in choosing we get to choose what makes us happy we get to choose to be thankful for the things that are blessings in our life <laughs> my goodness that that is right on par with everything that i believe it is our, it is our choice how we enter any room it is our choice our feelings towards a situation or whatever it may be and you know you make the choice in your mind 
if it's going to be a good day or a bad day, regardless of what happens and the things that we can't control, in which most of the things we can't, but the things that we can control, which is our thoughts and our actions need to, you know, need to be a high priority for, for really everybody. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, you mentioned you've, you grew up in Florida and mm -hmm. moved to Hawaii. You've also lived in a whole bunch of other places. <laughs> Um, talk about, you know, living in Oregon and Fiji and Africa and all of those cool places. Um, so I love working with children and families. I, I love the child development and the mental, mental approach of just trying to engage and give children tools to really understand their thoughts. And so when I moved to Hawaii, I was nannying, I was teaching for a while and going to school. And I did my first long distance hike on the Pacific Crest Trail. And when I came back to Hawaii, I was like, I don't wanna be here. I wanna keep, I wanna keep exploring. I wanna keep traveling. And like I said, being independent, being on my own, um, it, I really couldn't afford to just go travel <laughs> to whatever I wanted. So I found this, this company in Venture Nannies and they got to, they had job offers all over the world for families living in adventurous lives that just needed some help. So for the better part of, the last 10 years. It's actually how I ended up in California. Um, I've been exclusively working with this agency to take short-term to long-term placements uh, with families building homes in Africa or Olympians um, living and training at the Nike headquarters in Oregon and, and traveling with all these families. And it has just been the most amazing opportunity to see the world, get paid to do it. But not only that, be a part of children's lives while they're experiencing new culture, right. while they're seeing new customs and new religions and tasting new foods. And being a part of that process has given me so much in return because yeah, I, I never even left Florida until I was 18. Like I never really was anywhere else. My, my view was very like this. And now I feel like I've just expanded it. I'm so much more accepting and open and, willing to try new things and i think that is a very valuable um, idea when it comes to working with children as well is to encourage that in them for sure <laughs> now let's get into it <laughs> tell me about getting into long distance hiking like, who, who got you into that it sounds insane because for those people that don't know i mean it's 2,500 miles, you know, for the triple, you know, for the Pacific Crest Trail, mm -hmm. uh, like you mentioned, like it's 2,600 miles. That is crazy to walk <laughs> that. I can't even walk 10 miles without, you know, during, as soon as COVID hit, I was walking a lot. I think as all of us were, but even 10 miles, I mean, good grief. It's a, it's a lot. Your feet start hurting everything. So how did you get involved with uh, long distance hiking? <laughs> Great question. I was living in Hawaii at the time and I had just become really addicted to yoga and running and hiking and the island I was on, I had covered pretty much every hike I could find. And this was when the little app started to be super popular, Instagram. Mm -hmm. And I remember being able to go in there and find more hikes and, and connect with people and meet up with people and go on hikes. And there was this one girl who I was connecting with and, and she was like, well, I just got done doing this Pacific Crest Trail in California. It goes from the Mexico, California border all the way up to Cal uh, Canada. And I thought, well, that's crazy. Um, but it was just that realization that okay, everything in my life has led me to here. I didn't get hit by that car. I had that surgery for a reason. You know, I was able to be blessed with getting out of a marriage that wasn't serving me and to go find myself and to do some traveling. And so I just sort of asked her a bunch of questions. She said, you can, you're more than capable of doing it. Get the right gear. So I did. I told everybody I was going to do it. I made a huge list about nine months out, started researching the lightest gear. So I wasn't carrying too much gear on my back, researching the food I was going to carry, the shoes that were comfortable for me. I started training and it just became this beautiful addiction because the process of training for that, I was spending less money going out with my friends. I was saving all my money. You know, I was just ready for this, this thing. 
I want to my... stop you right yeah. there because I want to dive in. What sort of gear do you need? And like, you know, because you're going to be gone for three, four months. Mm -hmm. what, what, do you, what are the essentials that you need? And, and you, like you said, you needed it very light because you're going to be mm -hmm. carrying it on your back. Mm -hmm. Explain a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, if you're going to succeed, you're pretty much going to have to be an ultra light backpacker. So a, a good backpack weighs about a pound in design to, to be carried for that time. Um, one pound, uh, a whole a backpack? One pound. <laughs> so my, my, before food and water, my weight probably runs around 11 to 12 pounds um, of the backpack. So my sleeping bag, it's rated 20 degrees, but it's also made by a company that it's so light, it only weighs a pound. My tent itself, it's held up by my trekking poles, so I don't need to carry, you know, the collapsible poles. Um, also weighs a pound, and it's a two-person <laughs> It's a two-person tent. Wow. Uh, the, but the, it's more like the footwear, like getting the right shoes, because mm. you go through four or five pairs of shoes, and a lot of people have shoe issues, because your feet are sweating. You know, you always have to get a size to a a size to two sizes bigger because when your feet sweat and they swell and wear good good wool socks good um because you're gonna need some cushion trekking poles you know you gotta have to have a sleeping pad i like the accordion one that just like opens up some people like the inflatable ones but that was a big part of it um but i will tell you what when you get there and you actually step foot like day one by the time I made it to California and I'm, I'm at the border and I'm touching the monument and I see this, I can see Mexico and I'm just about to just walk for five months. It becomes a realization that it's 90% mental and 10% physical, 10% what your feet are doing, what your, what your backpack and your gear is doing. It's all about what your mind has decided you need to do. So as a basketball coach, I'm thinking that's almost like preparing for a new season. You go back and you, you look at all the things that you've done in the years past and what you want to do and what you want to accomplish moving forward. And now you've got this really great game plan and now practice starts. What, tell me what your preparation was like for, uh, you know, for, you know, training and getting prepared for that what were you doing were you running were you doing weights were you just only walking um tell me about that i was doing everything i could it became like i said the healthiest decision in my life because i was just doing hot yoga i was biking still as a commuter i was living in hawaii i was hiking as much as i could i was running i was taking some hit classes at the gym uh, I just started lifting and like understanding movement and strength training. Um, but I, I also locked it in my mind. I wanted to do 20 mile days right out the gate because I wanted to finish it in like four, four and a half months. Some people take up to six months, but I wanted to start strong and I wanted to be able to maintain that pace, especially because once I hit the Sierra mountains, I I'd never even really seen snow before I did my first long hike. A Florida Hawaii girl. So I knew I was going to be slowed down once I'm at 12,000, 13,000, 14,000 feet trudging in snow. So it was just, I did everything I could to, to train and prepare. And it just, like I said, it led me to now I'm starting next week my yoga teacher training and I became a personal trainer and I'm working on a group fitness instructor certification. So it had me fall in love with movement and exercise. Um, and that it's just been one of the best gifts that I will take with me and like have value to, in my life now. For sure. Wow. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, <clears throat> so you're at the border, you're at your first, uh, you're at your first long distance hike and the PCT is that what they call it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what was that first day? Like, was it like, Oh, shh. I, I mean, I don't think I could do this or what, what, what was that like? And were you by yourself or were you, were you, were you with other people or? Uh, so I started by myself. So it's a beautiful thing in the long distance hiking community. There's people um, called trail angels. And what they do is I essentially flew from Hawaii to California and they had some volunteers. They picked me up from the airport, drove me to their home, fed me dinner, let me sleep overnight with a bunch of other hikers. We were all alone starting, dropped us off first thing in the morning and we kind of just went for it. And this is the desert. So my first day, it got up to 100 degrees. I saw a rattlesnake within the first couple miles. And at this point, you're so close to the border to Mexico, you have border patrol 
and helicopters above you. And I just, I probably by mile like 13, 14, it was like, what have I got myself into? Like, this is so exciting, but I'm finally here doing this and it's hot. And I want to eat everything in my food bag, but it has to last me five more days until I get to another town. And I already don't like the music playlist that I made. So that first day was a lot of, oh, this is real. But I did the first goal. I said, I'm going to do 20 miles the first day. 20 miles, I get there, I set up my tent and I crash. I was exhausted. And I was like, this is what it feels like to be so tired mentally and physically that you just you're just wiped out. And so all those fears that I was thinking I was gonna like lay in my tent at night and like hear, an, hear a twig break and think it was a bear coming to get me, I would just have no time at night or no energy left to put energy and thought into being fearful. So once I end my day and I get in my tent and my head hits my sleeping bag, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I'm sure there's been lots of bears and moose and elk and whatnot right outside my tent. I've just been, passed out <laughs> wow that's great and, uh, one of my favorite shows is alone and i just uh, i envy those people like I, I i don't know how they do it but uh anyway back to you um how long does it take for the first for, or 20 miles a day like is that a whole day um I, well i like to hike right before sunrise to sunset it's so if, you start at 6 a, if you start at 6 a.m what time are you finishing? Probably when, when the sun starts setting. I like to like make the most use of my day, especially in the desert too. It's so hot, you essentially can't really walk from one to four o'clock because it's just so blistering hot. And you find one tree, you gotta get under it. You have to just absorb that shade. And it's also dictates about water sources because I generally want to camp where there is water so you can use it to filter to fill up your water and to cook with so i pretty much just like to hike from sun up to sundown and have like a good long hour lunch break it just depends on like i said where the water sources are and you know if you're trying if you're running out of food you're trying to make it to a certain trailhead so you can get to town and get some more food and maybe get your clothes laundried and maybe sleep in a hotel right <laughs> Wow. And tell me about that. You know, you're, sometimes you're few and far between the next, the next checkpoint or civilization and, you know, getting to that. What is that like? You know, when we were younger, you see these cartoons and the, the I don't know which one it was, but they're in the desert and found, they're seeing things, right? And mm -hmm. if they do see it, and it's like the best thing ever when they can see the water source, or in this case, you know, a, a human being or a <laughs> civilization, what was that experience like for you? Oh, it's incredible. It's, it's, it's so exciting. So all of these trails, these long distance trails, I've, essentially, I've started the Appalachian Trail and the Pacific Crest Trail alone, completely alone. But the beauty of it too, is that you meet so many incredible people I mean, the Pacific Crest Trail last year had like over 6,000 people apply for a permit to do it. So you meet so many incredible people from all walks of life, from all vocations, like doing a completely different ages. And that's the beauty of it. So by the time you do after five to seven days, get to a town and you have to get a hitchhike in, that's another element, you know, you're, the towns just aren't there on the trail. You have to, sometimes it's a 30 mile hitch. Sometimes it's a 10 mile hitch. So there's that whole element of trust, like, and the best part about finding other people and hiking with them is that I'm not a single female on the trail hitchhiking to get in town. But then it makes the cost a lot better and you have community. So by the time you hitchhike in with your new hiking friends, you share a hotel room, you know, you, you share the pizza delivery, you go do laundry at the laundromat together. But it is all usually the day going into town, you're all talking about what you're going to eat first, because hiker hunger is a thing and I would be able to eat an entire large pizza and still be hungry wow. and then go get the Ben and Jerry's and then get Doritos for my hotel room. So it's kind of like the best opportunity to eat like a teenage boy. <laughs> <laughs> and the, 
what is your pitch on the uh being a hitchhiker because i know you know if you see you rarely in the city do you see hitchhikers yeah. but when you do it's like ah uh, no but maybe you know this culture and people know about it like is there a pitch like do, is, just raise your hand or put your thumb out what is what is that like it's that but a lot of a lot of these trails like for instance the appalachian trail the appalachian trail goes from georgia to maine it's 2200 miles it goes through 14 states and it is also the longest run conservation project in the world. Mm. So it has a lot of acclaim, everybody knows it, and it's been there for a long time. So all these towns all can identify you as a through hiker, as we call ourselves, a long distance hiker. And they can usually smell you, and by the time you put your thumb out and you get in the car, the windows go down because you haven't showered in a week and neither have your buddies. But the beauty of it as well is like, because you're so well known, I told you about trail angels, they, so many people would just show up to trailheads where they could with coolers of food and snacks, or they'd come and grill out and be like, oh, this is just for you through hikers. I, I did this trail back 30 years ago. So you just experienced the most reviving faith in humanity that civilians or people who don't through hike have never been able to experience and it's a lot of trust as well but you know you'd get a couple come through and they'd be like oh you know we'll take you to the hotel but our granddaughter's out of town like you guys should just come we'll barbecue it at the house you can do your laundry at the house and i've just been on the receiving end of like the most amazing community and hosp hospitality from essentially strangers so there's a big element of trust um but there's a lot of following your instincts as well when it comes to your discernment for people and how they want to interact with you. It sounds so liberating. I'm so intrigued. It's so out of, <laughs> outside of my comfort zone. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I just, I'm, I'm intrigued by stuff that I'm uncomfortable doing. Like that would be super uncomfortable. I, I mean, I pride myself as being a good athlete, but at the same time, that is just so different. Like I didn't, um, uh, where were we at? We were in Kona, Hawaii, my wife and I, and there was this big, I don't know if it was, is it di not, not Diamond Head, that, that one's a pretty easy one, that's in um, Honolulu, but in Kona, there was this big hike, and it was like this, and what, what, what was it? Mauna Kea? It might have been, and <laughs> I was just so tired. I was walking up backwards because I was so, it was, it was <laughs> like the walk down was super bad. And then the walk up, I was like walking up backwards because my legs were just done. It was, it was, uh, yeah. And I thought I was in shape and I'm just <laughs> puffing and puffing and <laughs> button. <laughs> which, which is a whole other element too. You know, it's, I'm giving you some highlight reels. Like, yeah, you're meeting all these people and sometimes people do trail magic and they, you know, you get to go towns and do all this. But those, those miles sometimes you look at the elevation profile and you're like, oh, I have a 10,000 feet of climbing today. And some days just mountain after mountain after mountain. And some days you just, you're, there's, you can't look just stop. I mean, you could stop and have a snack, but you're also like, I have no other option but to keep going. I'm trying to get to Canada. I, I'm trying to, I just have to keep moving north, just one foot in front of the other. And the worst, I mean, I've never had any injuries, which is, is pretty Im impressive. But when I get to town usually, and I take like a day in a hotel room, we call it a zero day, zero miles of hiking. And we're getting more food and running around. The next day when I wake up, my body is just like, wrecked i call it hiker hobble you just your feet kind of swell up and you just hiker hu hunger hiker hobble i'm just i'm learning so much new vocabulary today you know? wow um and then so what would you do for like your body recovery you know as a if, as an athlete you need to recover your body in certain ways so what were you doing because it's so arduous on your body elevating my feet so pretty much every night i would put my pack under my under my feet where I, in my sleeping bag so I would just elevate my feet a little bit when I was sleeping because they would definitely get um, swollen at night. And when I get to town, I think sleeping in a bed is also really helpful once every week or two if you can. Um, but I'm a, I'm a big fan of hot tubs and getting in, get in the pool. So we try to get in cold a pool. pool. Cold, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cold pool and a nice warm hot tub and just like <sighs> mentally, I think it, as well for 
the recovery for your body, I feel like it's also like the, the mental recovery as well. So getting in town, getting a hot tub in a pool, calling my family, calling my friends, checking in on them, because I feel like that's how you also recover and kind of check back in with yourself to go back out and then put the stress on your body again. Inflammation is something that I've been looking at a lot lately and, you know, just trying to, I want to live as long as I can because I clearly really love life. But what were you, what were you doing for inflammation um, outside of raising your feet? Uh, I, the first trail, I it probably, probably took about a dozen uh, Tylenol, to be honest with you. But this last trail, I took Tylenol once. So it, that seemed to work really well for me, just elevating my feet, but also every five to six miles, I, when I'd break, I'd stop and take off my socks and I'd let my feet breathe. And I know it sounds silly, but I would talk to my feet and tell them, you're doing great. We have no yeah. blisters. You're moving. You're serving me well. I don't have hot spots. Self -talk. So, and, then, and then trying to put my feet, soak my feet on trail in water sources, streams, rivers, creeks, you know, crossing a water source, taking off my shoes, letting my feet feel the cold and the heat, but also airing them out, taking the socks off, you know, switching out socks every couple hours. So just sort of, you know, your feet are the most important things to your wheels. You got to take care of them. That's pretty much For the only sure. thing that would get inflamed. For sure. All right. So you're, you might be halfway through now. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me what that feels like. Does it feel like, oh, shh. I got, I've got two and a half, three months left, or does that feel like, okay, I'm making progress? It feels great because you're making progress, but then you're going to get into fire season, which almost every trail, you know, by the time you're halfway through, it took me almost three months to get through California. California is a large state. Right. <laughs> it's a large state. So, so by the time you're getting to the halfway point, there's fire closures, you, you know, you can't, you have to go around, you have to do this, you just come out of the Sierra, and you're also racing to finish because the snow's going to start, you know, you're moving north, and so the trail ends in the northern Cascades of Washington, the last trail last year, the Continental Divide Trail, that ends in Glacier, so if it's snowing, you can't really, and it gets bad, and it's first couple snows of the year, you can't really finish the way you want to, you're going to be trudging snow, and it's going to be white out, and it's, the most terrifying thing so you're halfway and you want to breathe and say okay i'm halfway but it's also like okay winter is actually coming i need to move fast i need to continue to move fast but at that point you sort of had to have a rhythm you're not carrying any silly things you don't have any extra things in your backpack you sort of embrace the smell and the dirt and you you know yourself a lot better so that second half is beautiful and bittersweet because it's also going to end and I, the first time, the first trail I did, one of the biggest fears I had was realizing that the most beautiful moment in my life is on a long distance trail. And I was very afraid that when I got done, nothing would ever bring me as much joy as being on a long distance trail. Wow. And that's a hard truth. You know, I've had a lot of beautiful moments. I've done a lot of amazing things. And it took me five years of doing this to finally feel out of place in my life that I get to create that same joy. It is not just on a trail. What, um, what brought you that joy? Uh, being able to, now being able to um, choose my happiness, choose my happiness and feel like I'm, like we talked about the traveling, but at this point now, like I want to ground. I want to be in the place I am. And I want to like continue to build my foundation and my branches and deep, deepen my roots so I feel like the, the joy was brought to me by the amazing times that I've had on the trail. And now I'm learning what I get to do with all that amazing time on the trail and how I want to encourage other people to seek their own joy. Wow, that's deep. <laughs> that is. Um, <clears throat> if you didn't have the trail, do you think you could have found that same, that same joy that you have now? I don't think so because it wasn't just doing the trail the first time, it was choosing to go then do the Colorado Trail and the Appalachian. I was continuing to seek and seek and seek and go all these places and do all these things because I think I was having a hard time looking in the mirror and like being with myself. And when you're on a trail all day, you have nothing but yourself and memories and time and thoughts and ideas and forgiveness and 
I, um, yeah, I attribute a lot of my strength and my direction from having that time with myself to check in with me. The pleasure is in the pain. Absolutely. <laughs> um, what were some of your thoughts? You know, did you go to some, some dark places um, while, while, you know, in isolation, essentially, for a lot of the time? Yeah, I, I had, um, <laughs> it's the same as ridiculous to say, I, I filmed a, a, a video to my parents of this may be a good vibe. <laughs> you know, by the time I was almost at the end, probably 200 miles from finishing, um, it was the second time I had hypothermia and I was by myself. My hiking partner was a day ahead and my other two hiking partners were two days behind. And you realize how important it is to have hiking partners around you. Um, and so it was just raining for like 10 days and it was starting to get really cold. And like I said, having limited snow experience, I remember that that night it was just raining, soaking through my tent, my sleeping bag was wet and I was still like 40 miles from town. And it's those moments that I don't, I don't even like think of them often now. I just realize how they were so necessary in the entire experience all of them, even the animal encounters where I'm like, there is a grizzly bear right there. But you can't succumb to the fear in the darkness because it doesn't, it doesn't progress you out of the situation. Like you just have to just, okay, I'm just going to keep moving. <laughs> you have to get up the next day, but you know, eventually like, and when I had hypothermia the first time, it was eventually if I keep walking, there will be a warm place for me to sleep and a the sun will come out. It just can't keep raining. I will be able to dry my stuff out. So you have to really shake it. You can acknowledge the fear and the darkness, but you have to like, like I said earlier, you can't live in it. You have to move out of it because that's how a lot of people quit trails. They allow the, the fear, the frustrations, the I miss somebody or all these different things happening to stop them. But you have to be willing to say, I'm doing this and I'm going to finish it no matter what. I mean, this is, this is awesome. I mean, this is uh, amazing. Like the, the amount of perseverance that one would have to have to go through these sort of things and, and just challenge yourself, not only physically, but most importantly, you talked about the mental part of it when you first get on the journey. Like it, it, it I'm not going to do 2000 miles, but I'm, I may want to do like 500 or something like that, because I just think it would be so, so liberating. You take your body and your mind to different places. And when you were able to accomplish that, you feel, you know, you, you feel alive, you know, for the first time. And I can just hear it and, and see it in your energy. Um, so that's awesome. So what was it like when you finished the first one? It was like, Hey, we're, I'm a few days out. I know I'm so close. Um, were you just smiling from ear to ear during that time, or what? What was your thoughts and feelings and all of uh, that? So the interesting, the interesting story about me finishing the Pacific Crest Trail was, I was about a hundred miles from the end. You have one town to stop into. It's called Stahican in Washington, and it's your last hundred miles. And um, there was fires that year bad in the area. A couple of firefighters have lost their life. So they shut down that hundred mile section. So oh. I was, I had to go around it and I pride myself on being a purist on not skipping any miles in the trail. And so I take the ferry to go around to that town to get off and do the last miles. And as soon as I get off that ferry, it was like a three hour hitchhike to get to the ferry. I get off the ferry, I land and they say, Oh, the trail's back open again. Got back on the ferry, turned around, went back to Stevens Pass, do the last miles. And the, the, the morning of, I was so nervous. I was like six miles out to get to it. And I tripped, woke up to snow. I was so glad I finished when I did. Woke up to snow, I tripped, and my knee just got this bloody, my first injury of the trail on the last day. Bloody knee, blood everywhere. But I was just so filled with adrenaline, I didn't even feel it. So there's a picture of me at the border, at the monument, at the border to Canada, um, just with this bloody knee, with this grin from ear to ear. But it was amazing because I'd never been out of the country before that. So I literally walked out of the country for the, my very first time. And it was exhilarating, 
and exciting until I got to the airport and I realized it was over. And I had a very emotional conversation with my mom, bawling myself, <laughs> bawling my eyes out in the Vancouver airport. But yeah, that day was pivotal because it, um, I realized I wasn't done and I wanted more. <laughs> wow. So <clears throat> what do you do when you get there? Do you, obviously you're going to gorge as much food as you possibly can. <laughs> find somewhere to stay and then where do you go from there like do you just go home or yeah you throw throw all your stuff away and well the worst part is I was like a it was like a three-hour ride on a Greyhound bus to get to Vancouver the trail is just in the middle of nowhere and you look around and even after a couple showers you're just with civilians but you realize you still smell because you're still carrying all your gear so yeah I got a night in a hotel and I just flew back to Hawaii and my friends had were all waiting for me at the airport and I ate yeah everything the hiker hunger doesn't really go away and that's something you learn after the trail is because but when you're not doing the miles all day you have to sort of put the hiker hunger away <laughs> for sure <laughs> wow that's that's incredible. Uh, and so, you know, how do you get to doing it again and over and over? And one was, so you did that. How long did it take you to do the next one? <clears throat> so I finished that in September of 2015. Um, and, and you started in what month? April. Wow. <laughs> yeah. April to September. Um, so then went back to Hawaii and was on a plane a couple of days later to work with the family in South in Africa. And then I was in Oregon and back in Hawaii and I was just doing anything I could to save up as much money as fast as I could to get back out. So in 2016, I hiked the entirety of the Colorado Trail with my best friend. She joined me, which was fun. That's only 500 miles, Denver to Durango, but that also goes goes up. Yeah. Sign me up for that one, I guess. Uh, Yes, it's it's so beautiful. It only takes about a month. Oh. it's over probably some of my favorite mountains um, in the world. So I did the Colorado Trail the next year. Did Do they have any for a week? <laughs> <laughs> I got two kids. So I can't you leave the, the kids John for Muir a month. <laughs> the John Muir Trail is about 200 miles in, uh, in Sierra. That's right here at your back door. Okay, that might be. I, cho- I chose Northern <laughs> California. <laughs> but yeah, I did the, the Colorado Trail 2017. Did a um, hike from the Himalayas in Nepal for a bit, about 200 miles. Did the Appalachian Trail. And then last year, I did the Continental Divide Trail. So wow. it was about 3,200 miles. It was the longest, hardest one. <laughs> so the Triple Crown of Hiking, there are mm-hmm. only 500 or so people that have done it and only 200 and something females that have done it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow. more people have actually uh, been to the moon than done the triple crown of hiking. So. Yeah, and, and doing my research, I heard more <laughs> people have climbed Mount Everest as well Yeah, uh, <laughs> than than complete all three of the trails. So you are in rarefied air for sure. Um, <clears throat> that's pretty cool. And when's the next, when's the next hike? I had actually attempted to, a couple weeks ago, go out and do the Tahoe Rim Trail. That's about 200 miles as well. It goes all the way around Lake Tahoe. Um, but due to the uh, fires, that wasn't a possibility. And nothing I felt comfortable doing, putting that smoke in my lungs. So to be honest, I don't really have anything next on my horizon. I'd like to play some more in the Sierra on some 14, 14ers and uh, just I finally feel like I'm I'm not running away. I'm just sort of running too. So maybe a trail will come my way again. Uh, I've got plenty more I wanna do, don't get me wrong. Sure. But as of right now, I feel, um, I just feel like it's a very grounded. And I think more of my process will be, I wanna write a book or a story and or create some af- like after school programs. Like I, I think if I would have had something like when I was growing up to sort of take me outside and, and get me in a community of people who like going on hikes and um, doing different things. I've become an ultra runner now, like running long distances on trails here is, is more of my speed now um, because I don't need to take off months and months of work and I'm trying to better my career and, uh, and move forward in that sense. So I think next for, for me on the forefront will be run 100K um, 
probably my, next my month. math my math isn't good so how many miles is 100k 62 62 miles wow so that's a lot yeah and how long you'll do that in a day that uh, i mean that that'd be a that'd be a hefty goal but okay. <laughs> I, did, I did i did my 50k um i was supposed to be running a 50k uh the quicksilver almond in here on in may but it was canceled due to COVID. So the day of, I still kept training. The day of, I found a little trail close by and still did it anyway on my own just to say I accomplished it. So the 100K will be next and then I'd be interested in the future and be able to, there's 200 mile races and all these different things, but there's a huge sense of community in it. And that's something I'm really seeking um, at this point in my life. Uh, I see a lot of value and I hold a lot of value in creating community and things that you're passionate about. How is that on your body, those ultra marathons? <clears throat> it's rough. <laughs> but again, training for it, I also get to eat like a teenage boy. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of training miles, but it also was like very therapeutic because I was training, you know, in the beginning of the year and then COVID happened in March and I ran the race in May. So I was using all that time of like uncertainty and the frustration, the puzzling stage of quarantine. I was using all that time to train. So it really was a therapy for me to be able to train and run miles and move through my thoughts and sort of plan for my future and think about how I was dealing with my feelings and navigating through emotions. So I just began to realize I can choose the same therapy that long distance trails do for me in right. my backyard with my running shoes on. And so there's a lot of people like you and they've been able to monetize it. You were mentioning before one of the, uh, the athletes is like a bunch of them are sponsored uh, <laughs> on, the, on the long distance hiking <laughs> and, and ultra runners, all that. Tell me about that real quick. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's, I mean, now with the way social media is uh, with advertising and whatnot, um, I actually was able to uh, pick up an ambassadorship with a hammock company, which is pretty great. So hammock gear gave me a whole hammock set up and with the under quilt and a top quilt sleeping bag. Um, but yeah, I think the best thing for all these like outdoor um, clothing companies and gear companies and shoe companies, it's rather than seeing somebody in a catalog, that's just some model, you know, posing, it's, an athlete who uses the product. Hey, this water filter helped help me not get sick once for 9,000 miles. Use a Sawyer filter, it's $30. Wow. You know, I love ultra running shoes, trail shoes. I've never had a blister once in 9,000 miles of hiking. My opinion is trusted. And so it's, um, I think it's a really good direction for knowing what the product, you're gonna get an honest review about it. <laughs> for sure. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, I want to bring more powerful women on the show like yourself. I think uh, just women in general are so amazing in so many ways. And you've obviously showed that uh, if there was one person that you think I should interview on this podcast, who would it be and why? And if, if you say their name, you're going to have to make the connection. <laughs> I feel me on the spot right now. Courtney Dewalter. Courtney uh, she is just went out to go set the the fastest known time in Colorado Trail. Uh, she's a long distance runner and she is one of the women that is paving the way for a lot of women um, in the running in the trail running community. Um, wow. But yeah, I, that's another thing having amazing women mentors and I feel like right now is an amazing time to be alive as a woman because there's women just breaking barriers and I, I, I love it. <laughs> Well, you're going to have to set that up for Courtney and I. Um, this was, where can everybody follow you? I know you have a strong following on social media. And, um, and where can everybody follow your journey and your path? Yeah, you're, I'm you're on. bring them so much inspiration. I mean, I'm, <laughs> Thank you. I'm super inspired. Uh, I'm going to go walk 30, 30 miles today. <laughs> uh, just Fearless Sarah. I'm on Instagram and Facebook. Sarah with an H. A -H. With an H. <laughs> um, great. Well, that was awesome. Uh, this is one of my favorite podcasts ever Aww. because it's so outside of my comfort zone. <laughs> but uh, I learned so much and I'm really, really excited to uh, explore this a little bit more. I think yeah, it's so get cool. outside. <laughs> Thanks Absolutely. for having me on, Chris. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Beyond the Buckets podcast. Please remember to 
subscribe, rate, and share the show with your friends. And until next time, take care.